Homo sapiens, who are we? Where do we come from? In chapter 16, we're going to begin a journey that will take us back to the very foundation of the family tree of humankind, and for that matter, all life on Earth. We are going to attempt to seek out the very beginnings of life on our planet. How did life get started? And for that matter, what exactly is life? And is there any way to know why life even exists from a scientific standpoint? These are some of the fundamental questions we will try to answer. No doubt this will be a daunting journey, but no matter how long or hard the journey, it always begins with a single step. Let's start our journey with a look at some of the basic aspects of the human body and the DNA molecule. From a scientific standpoint, life is basically a function of chemistry and physics. The body of an average human weighing in at 70 kilograms or 154 pounds contains approximately 7 times 10 to the 27th power atoms, or stated another way, about 7 octillion atoms. The hydrogen atom is by far the most numerous atom in the human body, accounting for about 62% of the 7 octillion atoms. This enormous number of atoms is largely represented by four elements, along with hydrogen, Oxygen, carbon, and nitrogen form the bulk of the human body. These atoms are bound together in various arrangements to form the molecules of which all humans are composed. The atoms of oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen account for over 96% of our body mass. Oxygen accounts for about 65%, followed by carbon at 18.5%, hydrogen at 9.5%, and nitrogen at 3.2%. Throw in some calcium, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, and about 33 other odd elements, ranging from iron to chromium to cobalt to molybdenum, and you have the makings of a human being. But try as we might to venture out and secure the 41 or so elements that make up the human body, we would never be able to create a human being from this odd assortment of elements. However, in the proper context, a male and female working in concert can produce a human being in about nine months. This is because life isn't just stuff, life is a self-organizing process. At the very heart of this self-organizing process is DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. Let's take a few minutes to look at the basic structure of DNA. If we examine this graphic of a section of a DNA molecule, it looks quite complex. Let's break the DNA molecule down into its basic building blocks so we can get a better understanding of how DNA is put together. DNA is basically composed of a phosphate molecule referred to as a phosphate group, a sugar molecule referred to as a deoxyribose sugar molecule, and four nucleobases, adenine, thymine, quinine, and cytosine. The phosphate molecule is composed of one phosphorus atom and four oxygen atoms. The deoxyribose sugar molecule is composed of five carbon atoms, three oxygen atoms, and ten hydrogen atoms. The normal ribose sugar molecule has four oxygen atoms. The deoxy in deoxyribose indicates the loss of an oxygen atom from the four of ribose to the three of deoxyribose. The phosphate group and the deoxyribose molecule bind together in an alternating scheme to form the phosphate sugar backbone of the DNA molecule, usually represented in depictions of the DNA molecule as the two spirals that support the stair-step nucleobase pairs. The four nucleobases are, of course, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. The nucleobases are classified into two types, purines and pyrimidines. Adenine and guanine are purines, thymine and cytosine are pyrimidines. The purines have a two-loop structure. The pyrimidines have a single-loop structure. The nucleobases bond together in pairs to form the stair-step cross-sections of the DNA molecule. This bonding is referred to as complementary base pairing. In this base pairing scheme, adenine pairs with thymine and guanine pairs with cytosine. This pairing is created through hydrogen bonding. As we can see in our graphic, the adenine-thymine pairing has two hydrogen bonds. The guanine-cytosine pairing has three hydrogen bonds. 
This nucleobase pair bonding variation guarantees that the base pairing will always run true to the adenine thymine and the guanine cytosine pair bonding. The nucleobases bind to the deoxyribose sugar molecule to form the attachment to the phosphate sugar backbone. Let's take a more detailed look at the deoxyribose sugar molecule and the phosphate group. Looking at the atomic structure of the deoxyribose molecule, we can see that it has five carbon atoms from which the term pentose sugar is derived. The five carbon atoms have been given a special number scheme which runs one prime, two prime, three prime, four prime, and five prime. The three prime carbon atom and the five prime carbon atom, along with their oxygen and hydrogen atoms, referred to as a hydroxyl group, are the bonding point for the phosphate groups. The one prime carbon atom is the bonding point for the nucleobase. A deoxyribose molecule bonded to a nucleobase is referred to as a nucleoside. A nucleoside with a phosphate group attached is referred to as a nucleotide. A single strand of DNA, also referred to as a polynucleotide chain, is built up of connecting nucleotides which can number into the hundreds of millions. The double helix structure of DNA is formed from the complementary bonding of two strands of DNA or two polynucleotide chains of DNA. In the two opposing strands of DNA, the deoxyribose sugar molecules are reversed or characterized as having different polarities. They are also referred to as being anti-parallel, simply meaning that the two DNA strands run in opposite directions. Looking at this graphic, we can see the reversal or differing polarities of the deoxyribose molecule. Note that this differing polarity reverses the positions of the three prime and five prime carbon atoms. The result of all of this very specific chemistry and physics is the DNA molecule. This DNA molecule serves to provide the genetic encoding for the instructions used in the development and functioning of all known living organisms on Earth. But how could such an astonishing thing as DNA come into being? Let's set about answering that question. Let's begin tackling the question of the origin of DNA and life on Earth by looking at the evidence for the earliest signs of life on our planet. The Earth itself is calculated to be about four and a half billion years old. This four and a half billion year time span is divided into four eons. The first eon is the Hadean eon, which begins with the birth of the Earth around 4.5 billion years ago and runs to about the four billion year mark. The Hadean eon is a very chaotic and violent time in Earth's history. It witnesses the birth of the Earth's moon through a violent collision between Earth and another large body calculated to be about the size of Mars. During the Hadean Eon, the Earth is continually battered and shaped through untold thousands of collisions. Colliding icy bodies pummel the Earth, providing the water that will eventually form the Earth's lakes and oceans. These icy bodies or comets may have also delivered the earliest organic molecules to our inchoate planet. During this early time frame, the Earth's surface is molten and highly volcanic, a very hostile place for the emergence of life. At the four billion year mark, we have the beginning of the Archean Eon. The Archean Eon is marked by the forming of continents and the emergence of life on Earth. Volcanic activity produces water vapor, which condenses and falls as rain, cooling the Earth's surface, forming pools, lakes, and eventually oceans, where the conditions for the emergence of life will become favorable. Volcanic activity also produces gases rich in carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, such as ammonia, carbon dioxide, and methane. Free oxygen was not yet a part of the Earth's evolving atmosphere. During the Archean Eon, we see the transition of complex organic compounds into living organisms, possibly by the 3.8 billion year mark. The earliest forms of life on Earth most likely resembled the present-day single-celled organisms of the domain archaea. Archaea are found thriving in a variety of environments, including extreme environments such as hot springs, salt lakes, and deep-sea thermal vents. 
The archaea are prokaryotes, meaning they have no cell nucleus nor any form of membrane-bound organelles within their cell body. One of the most interesting aspects of archaea is that they have been found living in the walls of undersea thermal vents or black smokers where they form the base of the food chain. Some scientists hypothesize that life may have found its start in deep sea thermal vents. We will come back to the Archean Eon and the emergence of life when we begin our look at the early chemistry of life. The Proterozoic Eon begins at the 2.5 billion year mark. The Proterozoic Eon is marked by the accumulation of oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere and the formation and breakup of the early supercontinents. The Proterozoic sees the birth of the eukaryotes, advanced single-cell organisms with a cell nucleus containing the organism's DNA. The eukaryotes also have more complex cell structures called organelles. The beginnings of multicellular life appear during the late stages of the Proterozoic. The Phanerozoic Eon begins around the 541 million year mark. The Phanerozoic Eon is witness to an explosion of complex multicellular animal life as well as the emergence of complex plant life. We find the first hard-shelled animals such as trilobites as well as reef-building animals such as corals. The Phanerozoic witnesses the appearance and evolution of all complex animal and plant phyla we know on Earth today. The Phanerozoic also witnesses the formation of the earlier continental land masses into the supercontinent Pangaea. Over millions of years, tectonic forces break apart Pangaea to form the continents we know today. The first geological period of the Phanerozoic Eon is called the Cambrian period. The rapid diversification of life forms during the Cambrian period is referred to as the Cambrian explosion. The term Precambrian is used to refer to Earth's history prior to the beginning of the Cambrian period in the Phanerozoic Eon. Let's now take a look at the scientific evidence for the earliest signs of life on Earth. The claim for the earliest evidence of signs of life on Earth comes from the Ishawa supercrustal belt of western Greenland. The Ishawa supercrustal belt is the oldest known crustal segment on Earth dated to 3.8 billion years ago, putting its formation in the early part of the Archean Eon. Scientists conducting research in the Western Greenland area published a research paper concluding that graphite contained in the metasedimentary rocks of the Ishawa supercrustal belt was biogenic in origin and thus represented traces of early life that flourished in the Earth's oceans at least 3.7 billion years ago. This is the earliest proposed evidence for the existence of life on Earth, but there is a caveat. An ongoing debate in the scientific community exists as to whether the Ishawa supercrustal graphite is biogenic or geological in origin. That is to say, there is a question as to whether the graphite, which is a form of carbon, was created by living organisms or geological processes. Research and scientific discourse continues on this important question. Turning to Northwest Australia, researchers in the Pilbara region of Western Australia have found evidence of early microbial life dated to about 3.5 billion years ago in stromatolites. Stromatolites are layered accretionary structures usually formed in shallow water by the trapping, binding, and cementation of sedimentary grains by microbial mats of microorganisms, especially cyanobacteria. In these photos, we can see the layers of the stromatolites in the rock structure. The layers are formed as the bacterial mats accumulate upwards toward the sunlight. Cyanobacteria thrive via photosynthesis, so they are continually moving upward through the forming sediments to capture the energy of the sun, thus creating the accreted layers over thousands of years. Some of the best examples of modern-day stromatolites can be found in Hamlin Pool in Shark Bay in Western Australia and in Lagoa Salgada in the state of Rio Grande do Norte in Brazil as well as in the Bahamas in Belize. Let's now take a moment to look at a very recent study that may impact the current view of the Hadean Eon and the appearance of life on Earth. A new study of zircon crystals from Western Australia may provide evidence that the Earth's surface had cooled to the point where oceans could form prior to the 4.3 billion year mark. This is quite a bit earlier than originally hypothesized. These small zircon crystals were discovered in 2001 on a sheep ranch 
in the Jack Hills region of Western Australia. A team of researchers led by Professor John Daly of the University of Wisconsin-Madison used atom probe tomography along with secondary ion mass spectrometry to accurately establish the age of the zircon crystals. They dated the crystallization of the zircon to 4.4 billion years ago. This puts the cooling and forming of the Earth's crust at the 4.4 billion year mark. This study also proposes that the formation of the Earth's hydrosphere and resulting oceans occurred prior to the 4.3 billion year mark. This would push the formation of the Earth's oceans back into the middle of the Hadean Eon. This earlier formation of the Earth's hydrosphere opens the possibility of favorable conditions for life existing well back into the current time frame of the Hadean Eon, opening the door for the emergence of life prior to the 4 billion year mark. Up to now, we have established a timeline for the beginnings of life on Earth as well as some possible evidence for the earliest signs of life on Earth appearing around the 3.7 billion to 3.5 billion year mark. New research even suggests that favorable conditions for life on Earth may have existed well back into the Hadean Eon prior to the 4 billion year mark. This evidence we have just looked at provides us with a general idea of when life appeared on Earth but we still need to answer the question of how life appeared on Earth. In chapter 17, we will begin to answer the question of how life appeared on Earth by looking at the forms or classifications of life on planet Earth.